Hello and welcome to Measured Thoughts. I'm Dave Reepstein, and I'm joined today by my guest, Sean Haggerty, the Chief Marketing Officer of Vanguard. Delighted to have you here. Glad to be here, Dave. Um, why don't we begin by you telling us a little bit about Vanguard? Sure. Uh, Vanguard is a mutual fund company, essentially. Uh, we serve the investment needs of multiple audiences, but uh, primarily individuals, institutions, and financial advisors. And uh, we do so through the distribution of mutual funds uh, to meet their various investment needs. And uh, we're the second largest mutual fund in the world, about $1.3 trillion in assets uh, under management. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. So tell me about yourself, you know, a little bit about your background and how you got to where you are today. Sure. Uh, well, at Vanguard, it's an unusual story, uh, as you know, a little bit about this history. Uh, but uh, I actually grew up in the business side of the, of the institutional business at Vanguard and uh, managed uh, sales and client services organizations uh, earlier in my career. And uh, at Vanguard, we believe in management by rotation. So I had rotated into a few different areas, operational areas, client service areas. And about five years ago, I uh, was asked to head up the marketing organization, which was uh, almost a brand new discipline for me, but, uh, but an interesting assignment because there was so much for me to learn, but also so much of just basic business knowledge that I already had to leverage um, as I, uh, as I uh, acquired the job. Um, given you're the head of marketing at Vanguard, why don't you tell us a little bit about the role of marketing at Vanguard? Sure. Uh, the role of marketing at Vanguard is pretty well defined, actually, in that uh, we are organized uh, into several businesses based on the segments that we serve. And the marketing organization is a centralized organization that is responsible for a few things in what I think of as just a strategic process. Um, first, we have a pretty large client insight organization that is really there to help um, inform those business segments and help them set strategy. So uh, obviously, some part of what we're doing in marketing is trying to you know, think forward and think about what are those things that we might be anticipating, what are some of those insights we might want to generate to help set business strategy. Uh, the business units are responsible for setting that strategy. We're responsible for then kind of working with that to translate into a marketing strategy, a marketing plan to help the businesses achieve their goals, and then measuring those results to say, hey, are we actually making progress on achieving business goals or not? So we think of ourselves in tight alignment um, with the businesses and helping to set the business strategy and then helping to execute the business strategy. Oftentimes we say, and I stole this from a colleague, but that uh, – uh, business strategy and marketing strategy, two sides of the same coin. And uh, you kind of have to have both working well in order to achieve business goals. Has that role of marketing changed much in the last five years? Yeah. Uh, I think the role of marketing has changed in the past five years. I think that uh, it, you know, probably you go back five, ten years, and I think that uh, it was, and what I like to say, the journey we're on is that marketing is moving from an expense that has to be managed to investment in the future. And so uh, I think that we have now looked at it as rather than something that, gee, we're spending so much in marketing, how do we manage that and make sure it doesn't creep up? We're now saying, how can marketing give us competitive advantage? And how can we use the discipline to actually gain competitive advantage? And how can we invest in it appropriately um, and thoughtfully to gain competitive advantage. And if it can't do that for us, then we shouldn't spend. But it's different, just a different mindset than let's manage that expense. If I ask that same question about the role of marketing uh, at Vanguard of your CEO, would I get the same answer? I think you would. I think the CEO would answer it the same way, that, uh, that we're on a journey towards marketing excellence. And uh, we've had that conversation exactly. And, uh, and I think we share that vision. Yeah. And would your CFO view it as an investment and not just an expense? I think the CFO would look at it maybe a little bit more with a numbers right. orientation um, in terms of is it, uh, is it generating positive NPV and the kind of ROI benchmarks that we set for ourselves. So I think that would be a little bit more precise show me the numbers um, discussion maybe compared to what uh, myself and the CEO well, would that, say. Well, that takes me to exactly the next question, which is, 
How are you measuring whether or not you're adding positive NPV or, or, or any of the other goals that sure. you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, I think you know, marketing measurement is an, obviously a, a topic that gets a ton of discussion in the industry um, and just about in any business that's doing marketing. Um, and I, I want to say, truthfully, there's a, there's a spectrum. Right. Uh, you know, to, to say that there is one catch-all measure that says marketing is or isn't effective is probably a little bit pie in the sky. Um, I think there are some things we measure incredibly well and have a level of precision where we know exactly what the ROI or the NPV is on a particular investment and others where there is a lot more intuition involved as to whether we should spend that money. What we try and do, though, and I think this is what's important, is we try and build at least to some composite on a dashboard that tells us, based on all of the inputs and based on all of the things that we're trying to achieve for the business segments, can we look at the composite and tell us whether that composite is trending up or down or, or staying the same um, that gives us an overall marketing measure? Because what we try and do is take all the different things we're doing, and there's hundreds, you know, maybe thousands of things we're doing, and then boil that down to the most important components. And then even from there, boil it down to marketing effectiveness broadly. And then we send that to the CEO's dashboard, and he has a sales and marketing effectiveness measure, and he uses our composite in that measure. Okay, I want to understand that. A little bit more then. Sure. So I suspect for direct mail pieces, yes. you sort of see what the direct response is that you exactly. get. But some of the efforts that you make don't have an immediate response. They don't have an immediate response. Yeah, I think that's yeah. right. I think also in our business-to-business um, segments, it's harder to say, well, gee, I need a, a, a suite of sales collateral to equip our sales team with. And that is a marketing expense after all. But can I say that that piece of collateral or presentations or the positioning work we do uh, in, a, in a B2B environment, is that responsible for that you know, next sale? It's hard to tie those things together. So we have other measures in terms of the effectiveness of the piece itself, but it's harder to link the effectiveness of the piece to actual cash flow. Right. So that's where we struggle a little bit. Yeah, understandable. Yeah. Just so that we understand Vanguard completely, what's the split roughly between, you, you mentioned B2B, between B2B sure. versus any B2C? B2C yeah. Um, the, uh, the retail business, as, as I call it, direct retail, is a little bit more than 50% of the business. And then our institutional businesses, which include financial advisors, so distributing our funds and ETFs through other financial intermediaries, and uh, direct to institutions represents the other, you know, just a little bit less than half of the business. Okay. In terms of trajectory, uh, the, the financial advisor business is one that's probably got the highest growth rate hmm. um, because of the success of our ETF uh, exchange traded funds. All right. You've been very successful there. We have had a lot of success recently there. Yeah. Um, okay. We, we have some understanding of Vanguard and what you've been doing there, how you've been there. Um, I want to make a transition for us to think about setting your marketing budget. Mm-hmm. Um, how's that set? How do you go about determining what that budget should be? It, it's a good question because we're right in the middle of that right now. It's you know, business planning time for uh, the next fiscal year is in the fall. And uh, we really start with, uh, kind of as I said before, we start with what are those business goals. So we first really want to work with our partners in the business segments and ask them, what are they trying to accomplish? So let me interrupt you just yeah. for a second. Give me an example of what one of those business okay. goals could be. So a business goal, for us, an important measure is cash flow. So uh, you know, net cash flow, how much are we getting from clients or prospects in terms of contributions into the mutual funds? So uh, we might have a goal that says, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're hoping to achieve a certain amount of cash flow sales from our sales team. Um, or uh, or we might have a goal of improving loyalty among the client hmm. base, uh, or might have a goal of redu- increasing retention, reducing the redemption ratio. So those are the kind of things that we might say, well, that's kind of a target. Now, interestingly, Vanguard's a little bit less bottom line oriented, outcomes oriented. Oftentimes we look at what are those things that need we need to do to get us there. But uh, basically, we'll say, okay, let's look at that. What are we trying to achieve? If it's let's improve loyalty, then we'll start to think about what are those things we might want to do from a marketing perspective to help 
engender loyalty or to help um, increase share of wallet or whatever that goal might be. And, uh, and then we'll essentially bottom up, build the budget from that and say this is what we think it's going to be necessary in order to accomplish some of those goals that we might have, both long-term and short-term. So some of those goals might be uh, we want to be known as the you know, fund company that has exceptional investment performance, right. and that certainly is a much longer-term goal. Um, and we'll build that budget up and uh, have a discussion really at a senior management level about um, both level of spend and spend across business segments because certainly we can decide to shift money between business segments depending on what we think is the priority um, you know, in that particular year. Yeah. So what you described was a, the process that you go through for setting budget yes. and then also how you determine the level yes. that you should have. How do you determine sort of how to allocate that With, within marketing? There's lots of tools that you have. Sure. So uh, there, there's a bunch of different ways we allocate. So there's there's media mix. That's kind of one whole bucket of discussion you can have about media mix if you're doing advertising. Um, if we're doing project based, we are looking for um, essentially what where do we think we get the most bang for the buck. So we are using um, you know NPV tools um, and uh, and other measurements that try and say. For that particular activity, what is the appropriate measure? Okay, mm-hmm. because I think different activities have different measures. And what have we learned so far in past activities that would tell us that this is the best way to spend money in order to achieve that particular goal, whatever it is? So, if it's awareness, as an example, and, we're, and, and we think we have an awareness goal, um, do we think that advertising is the right thing to do to build awareness, or is it some other mechanism? And within advertising, what with that particular channel, what uh, what channels work? You know, print, radio, direct mail, you know, whatever it might be, and then we build based on prior knowledge. So it actually sounds like you have it fairly well developed, down down to detail. What sort of tools do you have, um, or models? Do yeah, you have I for think trying- I think what we do is, uh, and to say well developed, I don't know. I think that we're <laughs> we're getting there. I I, I want to say. We we try hard. I think that most of our spend we do this with. I want to make sure I'm not unclear. And that some of the spend, it is still a little bit gut check more than pure tools. But essentially what we do is try and run experiments, you know, uh, on a constant basis and help learn from those experiments and then apply that to future activities. So, so would that experiment be we're going to do a, a limited sort of direct mail Yes, and we're going to see what the response and we'll, is. We all, we hold out control groups in every single piece of direct mail we do. Um, as an example, we did a design of experiments in a local uh, markets last uh, first quarter last year, uh, where we did a, a significant uh, increase in weight in advertising uh, in two markets. Um, we varied the uh, the different channels in those markets, and then had two control markets and try to see does weight make a difference at certain levels and what happens with respect to the allocation of uh, the money across different mediums and uh, and got some pretty significant learnings from it that we are now applying for what we're going to do next year. Yeah. So, so again, to give me a sense, how much of your overall budget is roughly yeah. is, um, is for direct Mail versus some more general yeah. marketing numbers. Right now, uh, direct mail is actually a very small percentage of our budget. Oh, wow. um, and you know, the reason I think it's so important to test is because you can read all the textbooks, you can listen to a lot of colleagues, but I think it's different for every industry and probably every company. And so I think. Uh, you know, you have to find out what works for your audience and for your business model. So for our business model, uh, in the retail business anyway, um, direct mail has not been all that successful. Um, It's successful with clients, um, just talking to clients about something else they might want to do. But in the prospecting, it has not been as successful as just a strong mix of media from an advertising perspective. That's actually been a little bit more powerful. In addition to what we always use and it's easy and it's free is word of mouth. You know, right. so for for Vanguard, we happen to be a, a very significant uh, word of mouth company that is just kind of how we've always grown up over the past thirty years, and um, we're 
fortunate in that we have that and therefore probably don't have to spend at some of the levels of our competitors because our clients are incredibly loyal and they're willing to tell others. So do you measure word of mouth? We, we are just starting to measure word of mouth and, um, and try and understand it better. It's an interesting dilemma in that, do you actually want to do anything about word of mouth? Right. Uh, or do you let that, that stay as is? So we're having a lot of discussions about that right now. What we do measure is we try and understand um, when we understand clients who are interested in Vanguard or who are new to Vanguard, we want to know how did they know about Vanguard in the first place. And it's interesting that for new clients, word of mouth is still the predominant source of initial awareness. Um, and interestingly, our website and advertising become more important actually as they move into a decision-making uh, uh, mode. So initial awareness, it's I had to hear that from a friend and it started to stick. And then I started paying attention to it. And exactly. And then the advertising on our website and other websites start to help you actually make the decision and, and, and buy. Um, so for us, the advertising is really important to word of mouth because they actually have to play with one another. And press is the other. So PR, advertising, word of mouth, those three things we see playing off one another. So I want to go back to your level of spending, and you do some testing, yes. and then you roll it out when it, the test you know, sort of indicates. How do you evaluate then the rollout and get a sense of was it, was it worth it? I think uh, probably based on you know, two measures. Um, I like to think of long-term and short-term measures. Um, I think that, uh, and, and we've gone back and forth. We've, I've seen the pendulum swing back and forth based on our own sentiments of what we want. And, and, and really, for me, it's swung back and forth. Um, sometimes I've said, boy, the marketing spend really has to generate positive NPV. And, and I want to see that immediate um, you know, response. Um, and we've kind of swung other times to, well, it's not about that. It's about brand health measures. Uh, awareness and uh, image attributes and uh, and space between us and the competition on particular image attributes. And I think where we're settling is some combination of the two so that we'll take some part of the spend and we'll say, what part of the spend, and, and, and honestly, this is where the intuition comes into play, mm -hmm. is what part of the spend do we think should be NPV oriented and what part of this do we think is image and brand um, oriented and, and then make the measure based on that. And, uh, and then what we'll obviously want to do is see, did we get positive NPV? And then obviously, did we see some of those long-term image attributes or awareness numbers move? And, and we set goals beforehand in terms of this is how far we want to see them move, or this is what kind of a gap we want to see between us and our competition. Um, so we'll measure against those. It's back to those original goals. That's that, right. That you said. That's right. So how are you or others held responsible? Is that is it just how much did we of our goals did we accomplish? I, I think that it's like I said. The, the, ultimately, how I'm held responsible is in composite. Did it does it all make sense? Uh, and uh, in, interestingly, I think that uh, we're we're encouraged to take risks. I think we're encouraged not not foolish risks, but to try new things and to experiment. I think it's an important part of our culture. Um, and I actually encourage that, and I think that others in the company encourage it as well. So it's not that we penalize somebody for uh, trying something new that didn't work. It's saying, let's make sure that we institutionalize the knowledge that that didn't work and try and understand why, and then use that to try and improve future results. And I think it's a primary distinction. You know, We think of ourselves as a Six Sigma company. We have something called Vanguard Unmatchable Excellence that we use throughout the company. And I think uh, it's interesting. Oftentimes, I talk to some colleagues who think of it as cost control. Right. And really, I think the difference between that and the way we use it, it was we do use it purely as continuous improvement. So I'm never worried about losing my job or, you know, uh, getting the budget cut because something doesn't work. You know, I would be uh, lose my job or get a budget cut if I actually didn't learn from all of what we're doing. I think that's a primary distinction that yeah. people need to focus on. Now, very, very impressive. Yeah. So as a company that learns so much from ex experimentation, I take it it's just as valuable to have experiments that don't work so that you can learn what not to do as it is to figure out what to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, you know, learning from failure is, uh, is something that whether you're doing it as an individual, but whether you're doing it as an individual or an institution, makes sense. So we uh, don't try and say, let's ignore our failures. We say... Let's actually learn a ton from them and, and actually bring them up to the surface. Okay. So 
We've discussed the budgeting process at Vanguard. What I'd like to do is sort of think about what are some of the tools that you might use for measuring Mm -hmm. sort of the effectiveness of any of the marketing. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I'm trying to find out sort of your measurement approach or what is it that you really look at for measuring intermediary results versus some long-term results. So you, you mentioned you've got objectives on both. Sure, sure. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you know, I think it starts with, uh, and, and I think an important part of the way we do things is that we have a partnership between the marketing organization, our business units, and our finance group. And we actually have finance professionals who are dedicated to the marketing group who are embedded. So they embedded as in they sit with us. So they're part of the team, but they actually resp- report up through the CFO. So we work with them to think about what are lifetime value models, um, and it differs based on business segment and institutional where so, we have. So on a customer-specific basis, you would have a lifetime value of that customer? Well, I don't, want, I don't want to say that we would have it per individual, but we would be able to look at uh, certain segments or, uh, or cadres even, people who come to Vanguard at a certain level. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's fairly predictive that if somebody comes in at level X, and they look like this, they're probably going to have a lifetime that, that acts as such. So we do that. Um, in the institutional business, it's much more pure cost accounting because they're very large relationships that require a fair amount of uh, analysis to even think about how do we want to price that piece of business. So we have a pretty good understanding of what the lifetime value of that client is. And so we'll use that um, in conjunction with marketing activities to start thinking about, all right, well, how much can I spend to attract the next incremental client? Um, And we'll look at both um, cash flow and some of the long-term measures. Now, I know the next question might be, and how do you link the long-term measures to the short-term measures? So does awareness and image attributes translate to sales? And I don't know right. the answer to that question. Right. <laughs> that, I, that I think is the holy grail. I have not, you know, we have not really solved that. But we, we are very comfortable in saying, you know, we understand the value. And what we do at least is say, this is what you would have to believe. And I think that's an important concept, that even if you don't have this precision tools, that we make people go through the spreadsheets and go through the analysis to say, this is what you would have to believe in order to make this investment. Sort of the inference of if we get this level of awareness, that will translate to... Exactly. You know, so at least such, make such the assumptions At least make the assumptions and think about it. And so in our ETF business, as an example, um, we said, well, if we, if we actually you know, invest in this business, um, what would you have to believe in terms of cash flow, market share, in order to justify this amount of spending? Mm-hmm. And so we kind of ran the, those models and then looked at it and said, well, I actually think we could achieve this. I think we could probably spend this. And it's reasonable to think that if we did it, we could get this amount in cash flow and market share. And in fact, we are. So, uh, so that was an experiment where it was difficult to be able to be perfectly you know, understanding of exactly what we were spending and what we were getting for it on a short-term basis, primarily because financial advisors and financial intermediaries, it's a little more opaque. It's not like the retail business where we know here's a social security number, an individual, and we got money from them. Um, It's a little bit harder to understand which financial advisors are putting money into our uh, exchange-traded funds. So actually, you've you've addressed two aspects. One, sort of there's these intermediate, and I'm not talking about time, I'm sort of thinking about the purchase funnel. Yes. So intermediary sort of measures that we have, which ultimately lead to some financial measures. And then there's a time sequence of it's going to happen over this time sequence. That's right. That's exactly right. Do you have as much faith in the long-term consequences as you do in the short term? If you do, I'll be amazed. Yeah. Um, Obviously, no. Not in the, you know, I think that what we, again, we have to, there has to be some leap of faith to say that those long-term consequences matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and interestingly, some of the data that we use to try and help us there is when we get a new client, we try and gauge it's self-reported. So self-reported is always subject to some amount of risk. 
but you know, when did you first become aware of us as a company? And, and we're amazed often that it is years before first awareness until initial purchase. So it helps you believe that getting that first level of awareness um, in, a, in a prospect is an important long-term goal, um, even though that that client who might become aware today might not buy from you for three or four years. Right. Um, and so, uh, so it, it gives us a, a sense of, yeah, that spend is probably worth it based on some of that data. Um, but I, I will tell you, if there's any place that it's harder to justify the spend, that's where it's harder to justify the spend. So Vanguard's really developed a, a great reputation. Um, do you measure the Vanguard brand value? We, we don't measure a numerical brand value primarily because we're not a publicly traded company. We're owned by the shareholders of the firm. Uh, I think sometimes we would toy around with, well, if a similar company with this amount of assets just got sold in the marketplace at, at X, maybe we might be worth Y. The fact is, is what we do know is that the value of the brand is astronomical compared to the value of the assets of the company. And therefore, we think it is incredibly important to think about you know, maintaining and protecting that brand value. Um, and that brand value has been built up primarily by serving now millions of clients whom are very loyal to, uh, to Vanguard. And that we take with incredible amount of seriousness. We measure satisfaction and loyalty uh, almost at a religious level and make sure that, uh, that those measures are, are going the way we want them to go. How do you measure loyalty? Well, it, it, loyalty is something that we went from satisfaction to loyalty probably 10 years ago, and I think it was when uh, you know, loyalty started to get a little bit more uh, play in the industries. And, uh, and we derived loyalty through multiple measures, regression analysis, to try and figure out what right. uh, was loyal versus not. We have moved, interestingly, to the net promoter score, which uh, y you might hear from other companies. And, uh, and we did so for a few reasons. Um, one is that we found that some of the research we were doing was starting to get voluminous. And uh, so asking, literally, there was one uh, survey where we asked something like 90 questions of one you know, group of individuals. And that starts to just border on the ridiculous. So we like the simplicity of asking one question. Um, we actually like the net promoter score scale. We think it raises the bar. I think historically people talked mm -hmm. about one through five and a four and five is a good thing. Now the bar is raised where it has to be a nine or a 10 and a scale of zero to 10. Um, so I like that element and, and of you it. Subtract the ones and you that subtract the, the ones that are Zero through six, so to get that net promoter score. So, uh, so we like that a lot, the fact that it's raised the bar on us, because we always had numbers that were consistent across all of our businesses and kind of consistent everywhere, that, you know, four and five, and they were always very high. So it almost felt like, well, you can't really do anything about it. Right. Now we've applied net promoter score, and we actually see more variation, and we see areas where we can focus. Um, interestingly, though, we think it's also important not to just measure net promoter score, but also to understand the drivers of the net promoter score. So we cheat. We don't ask one question. We ask one question on kind of a pulse level, but at least we've set it up to where at least every other year we're going to do research to understand what are the drivers of that score. I'm finding a lot of companies that do that because I don't want to just know where I am. I need to know what I need to that's do right. to change that's that. That's right. That's the outcome, and that's a nice outcome right. to have and to know, but you really have to think about what drives that outcome. Um, do you see the role of, of research changing in any way to help support some of uh, your measurement effort? Yeah, I think research has changed um, over the past several years for us, and I think that's changed in a few ways. One is I think that research is becoming more strategic, both in terms of helping to understand where we should be going, but also has been more strategic and I think more scientific in measuring the results. And I think that some of the things like Net Promoter Score and some of the brand awareness and image attribute work that we've done has gotten better. Right. The other thing that's been really important for us is research is not research anymore for us. It's client insight. And I think for us, client insight is the marrying of data with research. So it's one thing to get a Net Promoter Score. It's another thing to take that score and marry it with the underlying data and behavioral attributes that help you understand a lot more about that net promoter score. Um, and I'll give you one example I think is actually pretty impressive is that we have an advice service that we provide to our retail investors. And uh, 
and we had an NPS score that we thought was okay, but we wanted to uh, improve the score. And one of the things we did, not just driver analysis, but we looked at the underlying individuals, and we looked at their holdings, their asset level, their age. We just started to really slice and dice the data mm -hmm. and started by doing that to find out that there was a segment of the population that was less satisfied than others. Why? And then change the service model in order to accommodate that and saw doubling of the net promoter score yeah. based on that. Actually, that's great. Yeah. So marrying data with the research, I think, is where research has to go. We have a ton of data. We have a lot of research. Putting that together and creating insights that can actually change your business model, that's where the power is. So actually, that's a really good example of how the analytics have supported, you know, sort of changes in what it is you're going to do. Where do you think the analytics are sort of lacking the most? Where are analytics lacking? You know, I, I'm not there yet with uh, predictive analytics. Uh, and I know that we, we're trying, you know, we're trying to think of how can right. we predict. Um, but, uh, but I think to, to date anyway, I haven't been as happy with their ability to say, let me run a lot of regressions and I'm going to tell you who's likely to leave as an example. So I think there's a lot of people who are out there looking for regression analysis that'll, um, in, you know, uh, will tell you here's the next likely client to leave. I think there's a lot of false positives and that kind of stuff. And uh, so far I haven't been willing to use it uh, all that much in the, uh, in the service model. I might use it for targeting for market purpose, marketing right. purposes. I wouldn't want to really incorporate it in the service model because I think sometimes you just look silly. Looking silly is not good. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, you also earlier mentioned sometimes you have to make some gut decisions. Yeah. Um, and so I'm sort of curious how you go about, sort of in the absence of data, what's the process that you go for making some of those decisions? Yeah. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, it's, it's a combination of things. I think that there's always some data available. And I think uh, for us, when we talk about client insight, interestingly, we talk about that sweet spot between intuition and data. Because da too much data, of course, can start to send you in odd directions as well. So we always think that whether you have tons of data or no data, we think that you have to still find that balance between whatever data you can find and business intuition. And importantly, I think the, the way to make those decisions is to encourage debate and to encourage lively discussion. And so we'll get in a room sometimes uh, on a topic where we're not 100% sure which direction we want to go, and we'll set up formal debates almost and have you know, a group for and a group against, and uh, we'll listen to it. And then you know, ultimately, it's not democratic. You know, the person in charge makes the decision, and that's the direction we take. But I think the best way to make those decisions, those intuitive decisions, is to be open to a lot of thought have a lot of healthy debate, and then ultimately move forward, get everybody on the same page and, and you know, go one way or the other. And that's where you make those sort of implicit assumptions more explicit so you can debate you exactly. know, the underlying assumptions. That's exactly right. Yeah. So you have to challenge those assumptions and, uh, and then look for some underpinning of them. Is there some reasonable expectation as to you know, what you believe, or is it flimsy? And uh, that's why the debate's important. Yeah. So, okay, we've talked about sort of what are some of the measures it is that you have and how you go about doing that. Um, I want to move to talking about how it gets reported. And let me start by asking sort of internally, um, who's responsible for measuring marketing's performance? Uh, measuring marketing's performance is done really by in two areas. Uh, our client inside organization has a lot of tools to help measure things. So that mm -hmm. organization is responsible for helping to put together a lot of the data that, uh, whether it's research data or actual client behavior. Right. But the finance folks are the ones who really oversee that. And we have a, if you will, a metric steering committee. Matter of fact, we're meeting Friday where there's business folks, finance folks, and marketing folks that sit on a committee and what we try and do is agree on common definitions of success or measures. Oftentimes it's hard to decide, you know, uh, just data definition sometimes. What is a new client? What's, a, what's cash flow? So we agree on definitions, we agree on goals, and then we review the activity um, as a group and actually have some 
you know, broad-based steering of what goes on in terms of marketing measurement. And so that's how those measures are shared. That's how those measures are shared. Is it also yeah. shared, the performance of the marketing also shared sort of through your dashboard? Well, that's what we review at those meetings. So we will um, look at individual campaigns, and then we'll look at what happens on the outcomes-oriented dashboard. I, I, I have a, a, a desire to have outcomes-oriented dashboards for each of our business segments. Those outcomes-oriented dashboards are basically the funnel. Mm -hmm. So we look at what are the pieces, you know, the components of the funnel that are important to that business segment. Because one business segment might have complete and total awareness. You know, in our 401k business, there is not that many human resources or treasury managers that don't know that Vanguard's in the 401k business. So awareness, I don't even measure it because I know it's pretty much at 100%. But I do care there about leads and client loyalty, so I'll measure that. So whatever components are important to that business, we'll measure that, put that on the dashboard. And then we'll look at all the campaigns and other activities that we think are drivers of those outcomes. And we'll look at the campaigns and the outcomes of those campaigns themselves. And then we'll look at are they driving the measures broadly that are represented by the funnel. As I mentioned to you off camera, yeah. This sounds just too good. I mean, it, it, it sounds really fabulous. Yeah. Um, so what's missing? What's missing? Um, I think what's missing is that um, sometimes there's not as strong a connection between the individual activities and those outcomes. And I think that it's harder to prove because you need a lot of data points to say, okay, I've done the regression analysis and I know that the activities that I'm moving on the driver side are the reason I get that outcome. So as an example, if we got an, a significant increase in awareness, and we did have a significant increase in awareness um, earlier uh, in, this, uh, in this decade, and, uh, and I could have said, well, it's the advertising that did it. And somebody else could have said, well, it was the PR. And somebody else could have said, it was word of mouth. Or the new CMO. Or the new CMO. <laughs> <laughs> that it wasn't, for sure. <laughs> but uh, so the perfect attribution of the advertising is the element that drove that awareness, I think, is what's missing. And so that still engenders a ton of debate and where that intuition has to come into play to say, yeah, even though I don't have perfect data there, I believe that the advertising is a substantial contributor to the change in awareness. So I think that's where a lot of things get missed. Um, the other place that we have misses is, is um, within the business line. You know, some business lines have it easier than others in terms of the way they measure things. And uh, I'm going to meet with the head of our financial advisor business um, in the next few weeks to talk about how do I know how to spend that next incremental marketing dollar? And should I spend it on sales or should I spend it on marketing? What's going to help me to drive that next incremental ETF cash flow? And I don't think we have perfect tools that would help her decide you know, all things being equal, should I increase my marketing spend or my sales spend and what's going to get me that next dollar? I think that some of those tools are missing. Yeah. Well, th this has been absolutely fantastic. And, and thank you for joining us today uh, in Measured Thoughts. It's been extremely insightful. And thank you for joining us today. Okay. Thank you.